Let us turn now to the conduct of proceedings at the ICJ and see a little bit more concretely what are the various steps and also the incidents that may occur along the way. That is, between the moment of the, that the court is seized of a dispute and the moment it delivers its judgment. The court is seized of a dispute either through the notification of a special agreement, as you know, or through the filing of an application if the basis of jurisdiction invoked by the claimant state is a compromissory clause, is two optional clauses, or an expected consent in a case of forum pro gratum. From that moment onwards, the judicial machinery is set in motion. And a first procedural step is taken by the registry of the court. Under various provisions of the statute and the rules, the details of which are uh, rather unimportant here, under those uh, provisions, the registry notifies all UN, uh, uh, the Secretary General of the UN and all the UN member states and other states entitled to appear before the court. A special notification is also addressed to states that are parties to multilateral treaties whose interpretation is in question in the case. And furthermore, if that treaty is the constituent element of an international organization or if it, is, uh, if it has been adopted within the framework of that organization, uh, such organization will also be notified and it will uh, receive copies of the written pleadings. Notified states may also request to receive copies of the written pleadings of the parties. All this may sound very administrative and purely procedural, but the publicity given in this way to the case and the automatic character of such publicity stands in sharp contrast to arbitral proceedings. When a dispute is brought before the ICJ, the case is public and it resonates within the world community. And as we shall see later, it is because a certain publicity is given to a case that various types of interventions in the, in the proceedings exists. Then, after having ascertained the views of the party, the court issues a first procedural order by which time limits are fixed for the filing of the party's written pleadings. And there are usually two rounds of written pleadings. The claimant writes a memorial exposing all its arguments concerning the jurisdiction of the court and the merits of, the, of its own claims, and providing, of course, all evidence in support of its case. The respondent is then offered the same amount of time to write in response what is called a counter-memorial. And then usually a second round of written pleading takes place, with the claimant filing a reply and the respondent filing a rejoinder in response to the reply. When the parties have filed all their written pleadings, oral pleadings take place, and there again two rounds of oral pleadings are usually organized. At the end of the oral pleadings, the agents, that is, the official state representatives, having usually the rank of an ambassador, the agents of each disputing state reads out their respective final submissions. And then the court begins its deliberation, and the judgment is delivered a few months later. I shall come back on the internal deliberative process leading to the actual drafting of judgments in a separate video. If the respondent state does not appear in court, or if it fails to defend its case, the claimant may call upon the court to decide in favour of its claim. But before doing so, and as Article 53 of the statute uh, states, the court must, however, satisfy itself not only that it has jurisdiction, but also that the claim is well-founded in fact and law." End of quote. Well, this is the procedure in its streamlined form, when no procedural incidents occur. But incidental proceedings do happen most of the time, and they will increase the complexity of the entire process. And let us turn now to those incidental proceedings in the next videos and readings.